Rome, a modern city with an ancient history. One legendary symbol of the city's turbulent and glorious past, the Colosseum. According to legend, the gladiators will be very lucky to escape from here alive, their fortunes determined by a turn of the thumb. According to legend, ferocious animals were brought here from across the Roman Empire to devour Christian martyrs, and then meet a bloody end themselves. But one legend in particular persists, that from time to time, this massive stadium was flooded in order that famous sea battles could be reenacted, battles in which hundreds died. Could these legends possibly be true? To find out whether the legends of the Colosseum are fact or fiction, Unsolved History has assembled a team of archaeologists, historians, and scientists to find the answers. Take them here and look at this. Look what's... Daniel Martinez is Unsolved History's chief investigator. Dean Abernathy and Bernard Frischer have built a virtual Colosseum. Heinz Beste is an archaeologist and engineer. Kathleen Coleman is a classical scholar. Marcus Yunkelman specializes in the history of the gladiators. And Martin Crapper is a hydraulic engineer. By combining historical evidence with the scientific tools of the 21st century, Unsolved History's team of experts will take us back to the first century, showing us the Colosseum the way it was then. To imagine it would have been completely... The team will debunk a myth or two. Unearthing new evidence about the engineering feats of the Roman architects. Wow, this is amazing, Dan. And if you look down there, you know, they were probably watching... Shedding new light on what it was like to be there. Either as a spectator, there for fun, or as an unwilling participant, about to meet a bloody end. Through the centuries, it was ravaged by earthquakes, fire, looting, and neglect. But the ruins of the Roman Colosseum still managed to amaze more than three million visitors every year. Back in AD 80, when this architectural wonder was first opened, it must have been even more amazing. When this amphitheater was full, with 45, 50,000 people, the noise and the atmosphere and the hype must have been considerable. There's so much excitement that people get sucked into it. This was the greatest entertainment complex the world had ever seen. It really is an expression of the power and the wealth that Rome had achieved by 80 AD. 2,000 years ago, Rome lay at the center of a vast and thriving empire. But in the first century AD, the city was experiencing troubled times. In AD 64, a ferocious fire gutted the center of the city. Amid accusations and recriminations about the cause of the fire, the young emperor Nero claimed the charred city center as his own and built himself a sumptuous palace covered in gold. It was not a popular move. After years of further misrule, the Roman Senate decreed that Nero should be flogged to death. Sparing himself that humiliation, he took his own life in AD 68. Vespasian took over as emperor and decided that he needed a grand gesture to impress the people of Rome. And so he commissioned the world's greatest amphitheater on the site of Nero's palace. What they were saying was, we are giving the center of Rome back to the people. And they made this huge entertainment building, this amphitheater, because at that point, Rome had no amphitheater. It took more than 20,000 workers almost 10 years to realize Vespasian's dream. The result, known at the time as the Amphitheatrum Caesarium, was simply staggering and it became one of the most celebrated architectural wonders of Roman antiquity. Almost 200 meters long and 50 meters high, it could seat an audience of 50,000 people, room for one out of every 20 people in Rome at the time. Probably for the first time in history, crowd flow became an issue in public architecture. One of the sophisticated features of the Colosseum is the way you get into it. And th that series of corridors and staircases, which enable you to get from ground level up into the seating, doubles as the support for that seating. So you, you get two for the price of one. And all of it was free to Romans. All they had to do was match the number on the ticket to the number on an entry arch and make their way up through the maze of corridors to their seat. But after walking through one of these arches, what lay ahead for the ancient Romans? To find out, Dean Abernathy and Bernard Frischer from the University of California in Los Angeles rebuilt the Colosseum inside a computer. 
these are archaeologically correct because they sh they show the stairs right. going up here. Reconstructing the Colosseum is no easy task. Its size still overwhelms even the fastest computers. Probably the biggest challenge for making this a complete building was uh, trying to come up with a way of decomposing it into smaller elements that we could actually build on a computer. <laughs> Otherwise, if you're trying to manipulate the entire building, um, it tends to overwhelm the machine. It took a year of detailed programming to recreate this wonder of the ancient world. It's time to have a look around. So show me what you've done, Dean. Okay, well, let's enter through one of these lower doors here. The tools of modern science reveal the ingenuity that enabled this architectural masterpiece to remain in use for almost 500 years. This is exactly uh, the second level of circulation with the staircases that pop us out into that. This will be that, the dark ring, the red one here, and that shows us the angles that go down into, that, into the green level. This is great, Dean, because it really shows the ingenuity of, of the engineers who designed this building. To understand the events that took place in this building, you have to put yourself inside it. We create the simulation so that we can go back and sit in the seats that the Romans sat in. We can see the things they saw. At last, the researchers here at UCLA can offer us a glimpse of how it must have been to stroll around the corridors and terraces of the Colosseum nearly 2,000 years ago and witness the glory and the gore of gladiatorial battle. After two millennia, the Colosseum is still Rome's crown jewel. In its heyday, it stood at the heart of an empire that seemed obsessed with death. What was it like to watch the brutality played out on the arena floor? Well, you know, Bernie, 2,000 years ago, we would have had tickets that matched the numbers of the doorway, but we haven't put the numbers in yet. Well, if it makes you feel any better, I forgot the tickets at home. But let's go on inside. I think we can still make our way to the best seats. This part of the building was reserved for the senators. Yeah, it's pretty dark in this quarter, about 60 or 70 feet into the building. Yeah, the only daylight's coming from the seats. Well, let's go up and take a look and see what kind of view the senators had. Wow, it's incredible. Yeah, you can actually see the gladiator figures down there. You can see them pretty clearly from this point. Yeah, we'd be even closer if we were sitting down there with the emperor and top state officials. But in the uppermost levels of the amphitheater, it's a different story. Well, Dean, we've come up to a part of the building that doesn't even exist anymore. Yeah, we had to recreate this from just traces of the stair and the existing outer wall and examples from other Roman buildings. This is where the lowest of Roman society would sit. And if you look down there, you know, they were probably watching uh, more of the large game action and things rather than the individual combat. And of course, partying with the neighbors. Walking around this virtual Colosseum offers us a sense of its scale, but it's not necessarily the size that shocks. Some sections are surprisingly small. Here we are in the smallest and narrowest corridor in the entire Colosseum. But it's even worse than you might uh, consider because of the fact that everyone in the upper levels had to exit through this corridor. So it was quite a jam in here. The idea that's held by most uh, artificial historians is that it's this uh, kind of paradigm of circulation and, and crowd control. Um, when you look at that passage and you actually you know, use the model to go inside and experience it, you realize that it's actually a, a much more complex system than that. Most classical scholars claim that the Colosseum could be emptied in just five minutes. The virtual Colosseum disproves this theory. But was this dingy upper corridor a case of poor design? Something more ingenious. Maybe it's some sort of a filter that would uh, keep them from emptying into the lower levels and would allow, allow the upper classes to clear out before the lower classes did. So in that sense, it's rather than just optimizing circulation, it's sort of you know, controlling it and tweaking it in a very sophisticated way. The complex layout of entrances, corridors, and exit routes, known by the rather unappealing term vomiter is, is a model of sophisticated crowd control and audience flow management. It's a design that today's stadium professionals know well they're still using the same principles 2,000 years later. You can walk into any arena, any stadium in this country alone, and I think internationally as well, and you'll see the similarities of the designs, the various vomitories, how they were doing people moving in those days, how they got people to the upper uh, levels of seats, how they got them to the bottom levels of seats. The Coliseum is the mother of all arenas. And just as modern stadia have their corporate suites and VIP boxes, it's clear that the Colosseum was segregated according to a person's social standing. The whole of Roman society was present in the Colosseum, all properly arranged according to their status in the society. So at the bottom on the south axis, right up, up against the arena, you had the emperor. That was the prime viewing position. And around him would have been the senate because they were the most important order in society. Behind them, the equestrian order, who were also one of the upper classes. 
Next came the free men, and above them, in the uppermost tiers, the ones with the worst view, the women and slaves. But if the design of the Colosseum was complex above ground, it was no less so in the parts the audience couldn't see, below ground. A maze of underground corridors and chambers called the Hypogeum. During a show, it would have been buzzing with activity. Now, Daniel, you have to imagine it would have been completely dark down here, just lit with flares, all smelly and smoky. Because of the arena floor above. Well, not only that, there was a second story down here. Yes, look at that arch. That would have supported another floor, so right. there were actually two floors down here. The two levels of the Hypogeum were linked to the arena floor above by a system of human-powered lifts. And look, just look at that. That's for a winch. Oh, well, they would turn it. Yes, yes. And, and it, it would help have... raise an elevator? Yes. And here on the left, we can see a very good example of an elevator. You can see the grooves. Look at the middle groove there. That's where right. the elevator would have fitted. And the counterweights would have slid down this possibly. Yes, on both sides, actually. You can see the other right. slot on that side. I so see. everything could be raised up through there. Maybe. During a show, stagehands under the arena floor created effects that must have astonished the crowd above. They could make a ferocious lion appear, as if from nowhere. Or lots of lions if that's what it took to satisfy the crowd. The trap doors would pop open and then in would leap some poor terrified creature, some exotic animal from the furthest reaches of the empire. It must have seemed as though it was magic. The magic of a day at the amphitheater usually began with the animal action, often a dramatic reenactment of a heroic hunting story set in some distant land. The animals that were displayed in these games were all different species. Uh, lions, rhinoceroses, ostriches, tigers, all kinds of animals, brought from the far corners of the empire. These animals were the fruits of Rome's global dominion, brought to the capital for the common man to see and see killed. In the alcoves around the arena, archers were positioned to protect the crowd from any vicious animal that might try to escape. At midday, most of the wealthier Colosseum goers would leave for lunch, but most of the crowd stayed for the halftime show, the executions. They made drama out of executions. They restaged the ancient myths, and uh, the bloodier the better. The legend that Christians were either thrown to the lions or were martyred in the Colosseum probably stems from this lunchtime diversion of an execution or two, but also, it's probably not true. It seems the myth was encouraged by the Catholic Church in the 17th century, who found it convenient to claim that Christians had been martyred there in antiquity. There's actually no evidence that this ever occurred. But the ruins were fortuitously saved nonetheless, which is why the Colosseum still stands to this day. Back at the amphitheater, after a suitably satisfying lunch, it was time for the top of the bill action, the gladiators. It was the most dangerous combat sport of all times. Most people imagine gladiatorial combat as a fight to the death, and that all gladiators were basically the same, armed with a sword and shield. But historical evidence paints a different picture. There were, in fact, many different forms of gladiators, each waging a specialized form of combat. The most common form of combatant was the Murmillo. Based on a Roman legionnaire, he was heavily armored with a long curved rectangular shield, the scutum, a short sword, padded protection on his right arm, and a short leg protector, or greave, on his left leg. The secutor was a variant on the Murmillo, differing only in his helmet, which was less ornate, and the eye holes, which were much smaller. The Hoplomachus, based on a Greek soldier, bore a small round shield, a long lance, and two high greaves. The Thraex had a medium-sized squared shield, greaves to the knees, and a curved sword. The strangest fighter of all was the Retiarius, with no protection aside from a shoulder shield. His weapons were simply a net, a trident, and a short dagger. What were these fights like? It suggested that a single painting is responsible for molding our perception of gladiatorial combat. In 1872, French painter Jean-Léon Jérôme 
created this famous work, Palice Verso. Jerome made every effort to get the historical details right. Most people think he succeeded. It's said that this image inspired the look of the film Gladiator. But is it accurate? When we look at Jerome's interpretation, we see two sections of seats in the lower portion of the Colosseum, but there should actually be four. The emperor here is sitting in his grand chair, and yet no netting that surely would be there to protect him. If the seating arrangement is wrong, perhaps we should look more closely at Jerome's rendition of gladiatorial combat. It appears that it's a mass combat in which the sole survivor, the last man standing, is the victor. Was this the way gladiators fought? The victorious gladiator now glances up at the first row of Vestal Virgins who are gesticulating the Palike Werso, which is the Latin term for turned thumb. Jerome translated turned thumb as thumbs down, but that was just a guess. Did the Roman crowds ever make this now notorious gesture? Gladiatorial combat was very, very professional, and the gladiators are highly trained. One should think of it perhaps in terms of the modern the boxer or the fencer. Military historian Marcus Yunkelman is a leading expert on gladiatorial combat. He's even created his own troop of fighters. This practical research gives him the insight which is lacking in the history books. The normal impression that uh, gladiator combat in the arena was a, a, a mess, was a, a chaotic melee of, of dozens of fighters and uh, all against all and without rules is completely wrong. Contrary to popular depictions, a referee would always be close at hand and only two gladiators would fight at a time. The Romans also had specific formulas for pairing types of gladiators. This is a classic couple of large shield men, the Momillo, against the small shield men, the Trax or the Thracian. The Momillo is very well protected in front of him, while the Thracian with his small shield will surf around him to get into his rank. And uh, he has a curved sword. He can try to stab around or beneath the shield of his adversary. The Momillo could also battle the Hoplomachus, whose extra reach with a long lance was balanced out by his weaker defense, a small round shield. Some gladiator types, like the Equus and the Provocator, were pitched against fighters of the same type, but the Romans seemed to love odd pairings. The Retiarius is the most lightly armed type of gladiator, only protected by a small bronze shield on his left shoulder. And his uh, weapons are a uh, net which, uh, with which he tries to overthrow his adversary, and then following up uh, the attack with his trident, always uh, keeping his enemy at a distance, while his heavily armored pursuer is seeking the infight. His strength is hand-to-hand -hand combat, always the left shoulder with a shield in front. This combination of heavy gladiator and a very swift light gladiator was was thought by the Romans to be the most thrilling type of uh, fighting, and therefore it became the most popular. The net fighter only stood a chance if he could tire his heavily armed but visually restricted opponent. The Retiarius was the perfect underdog, one the Romans loved to see prevail. Above all, the crowd wanted to see a good fight that would last more than just a few seconds. So the most vulnerable part of the gladiator, his face, was well protected with a visor. I think the, that the visor, which takes away your personality and makes you almost like an a impersonal monster to make a fighter more aggressive, to attack his enemy in a worse manner than he did when he would see his face. But how did the duels end? Not always with the death of one of the combatants. The scale of bloodshed is extraordinarily exaggerated. About 20% of the fights ended with a death, 80% survived. Many battles ended in a draw, both gladiators walking wounded from the arena. But if one man could no longer keep up with the fight... Then he dropped his shield and raised his uh, left hand with a uh, finger stretched out. In that moment, his adversary was no longer allowed to attack him. Whether the defeated gladiator should now live or die, depended on the whim of whoever had paid for the games and the roar of the crowd. If the crowd felt the loser had fought well and hard, they would urge his pardon. People made a fist with uh, the thump pressed on and cried, Missum. Then he was beaten but alive and could leave. But if the crowd were unimpressed or if he was too badly injured to recover, the outcome would be swift and final.
he had to accept this as a death sentence, like uh, an execution. He had to kneel down and, without showing any emotion, uh, awaited the death blow by his adversary, who stabbed him normally into the throat. And what of the famous thumbs-down death sentence? The historical evidence suggests an alternative gesture, not thumbs down, but the thumb pointed to the throat, mimicking the final deadly blow of the victor's sword. So, Christians probably weren't martyred here. Gladiators didn't always die. The thumbs down gesture is a myth. Indeed, the place wasn't even called the Colosseum. So what of that other legend? The one that suggests that full-scale sea battles were staged inside the amphitheater. Is this another tall tale from antiquity? It's known that the Romans reenacted naval battles in lakes specially excavated for the purpose, and that they were hugely popular. But could these battles, called Naumachia, ever have taken place inside the new Colosseum in AD 80? According to the Roman poet Martialis, who was there at the time, they did. When you read Martial, you see that he says these things happen. But he's writing poetry, so did he mean it? If he meant it, then how do we explain the mechanics of it all? He talks about the miracle of uh, a visitor to the arena arriving rather late and finding that instead of land in the arena, there was sea. But to create a temporary sea in the Colosseum would have required some major architectural plumbing. Historian Daniel Martinez decided to investigate. I'm in the center of this tunnel, and as I work my way down, I start to see artifacts in the higher level. Normally, the water would flow right through here on its way out. But debris up here could only be here if there was a great flood of water coming through or a namakia. And if that's the case, then the debris and mud is caked up here. And look at this. Look what's sticking out. All along here are pieces of what looks like shards and pottery, but this is bone with teeth in it. So the drains were clearly designed to cope with large volumes of water. They could be closed off when necessary. Vertical slots in the walls suggest they were fitted with sluice gates. But where was all that water contained? Obviously, it must have been in the hypogeum, but the existence of this two-story maze of stone and brick walls would make staging a naval battle impossible. But then, archaeological engineer Heinz Beste made an intriguing discovery on a dig in the hypogeum in 2002. As he scoured the floor of this underground labyrinth, he uncovered some large stone blocks cut with square holes. At first, he thought they were part of the Romans' ingenious lift system. When we first saw these square holes, we thought they were for the elevators or the winches, just like the circular holes. But then we began to discover more, and we noticed that there was a regular pattern. Eventually, Beste found 18 blocks with these square holes. When he plotted them out, the pattern looked like it was part of a bigger design. It was. The hypogeum we see today is not the way it always was. We always wondered how it was possible to have a naval battle and gladiatorial fights in the same place. But in the beginning, these walls you see here didn't exist. The arena was held up by a wooden substructure that could be removed. But removing the entire floor of the arena and the posts and beams that supported it would have been a major undertaking. Well, the great thing about Roman society was that manpower wasn't really a problem because that was a slave society. And with enough people on the job and highly trained and possibly with the threat of something nasty happening to them if they made a mistake, we know, for example, that Claudius is supposed to have ordered a couple of mechanics from the arena to be thrown to the beasts because they defaulted on a job they were supposed to be doing. So I suppose there was a strong incentive for doing it efficiently. And it was also part of the, uh, the can-do mentality of the Romans, um, always outdoing nature and managing to to do the impossible. Many historians believe it would have been impossible to change the arena from land to sea or from sea to land in less than a week. But at a stadium in Los Angeles, Lee Ziebman was able to prove that the impossible can be done. He manages the changeover between huge sporting events. Now you got the seats coming in here. But you got all these guys that are, that are standing around here waiting to do this. When you just get a couple teams that lift, put it down, lift, put it down, and then we'll throw some more guys on that, some more guys on that. Quite often, Lee Ziegman's stadium has to accommodate two completely different sporting events in a single day. 
Today, he has to turn his ice hockey rink into a basketball court in under three hours. So we're just about ready for the uh, game to end. There's about a minute to go in the game, and the guys are going to get ready. The first thing that's going to go out there is a Zamboni. That's going to have to clean the ice. Once that's done, about 40 guys are going to run out there like bats out of heck. they'll start to bring the subfloor down that's actually going to go over the ice. Once that floor goes down, then we'll start to build everything up, up above that. Similar to what they probably did in the Roman Coliseum days where they build the subfloor. This is the chalk line that will actually indicate where the edge of the basketball floor goes. Each pallet is lettered, so you work in sequence. Um, this type of floor, you could build it from the insides out. So you lay the center one down, then you can build on the outside, and then you can build on the inside of that. That's the key to get it done quick on a, on a floor like this. Generally, you can put this floor together in about 45 minutes with about 14 guys working simultaneously on each end of it. It all works the same. It's manual labor. As you can see, you've got to slide the floor into place after it's been dropped, line up the holes, drop the pin in there, get back there and then push the thing back into place, line up your other pin and drop that in there. A crew of 40 highly trained men has just completed a giant jigsaw puzzle with more than 1,000 pieces in just over two hours. How long did it take him? Two hours, 23 minutes. 2.23. So I should have given him the sweet and the food and everything, huh? No, you have to give him the sweet and the food. You're outnumbered right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> 223, great job, guys. You guys did a great job out there today. Now, you know what? If you didn't do a good job back then, they would have thrown you to the Lions. Here, we're not even going to do that, are we? We work for the Lions. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, could the Coliseum's five-meter-high subfloor be assembled in less than a day? To Seedman, the job looks familiar. What you would probably have is various beams, and they would all notch together, similar to what a basketball floor does nowadays. It's, it's not one continuous piece. It's tongue and groove. There had to be some kind of metallic coupling that they would have engineered and put this together. Even the work schedule looks feasible. In modern day, I could tell you right now that to, that to convert something in, in Staples Center, you could go anywhere from two to six hours. Here, you're talking about such a, such a surface and such a design that, A, obviously they had to have a good plan. They probably would break this up into quadrants. And I think the minute they got that water out of there, you can throw maybe 50 guys or so per each quadrant, then have your rest of your crew that actually lug the stuff in there. And this could conceivably be done within an 18 to 24 hour period. What it takes to run a stadium hasn't changed much in 2,000 years. It's just that today we use forklifts instead of ox carts and crowds still flock to see modern-day gladiators in combat and to see the latest in technological showmanship. In the first century AD, the Romans were very proud of their technological achievements, particularly their ability to control and manage that most precious urban commodity, water. Water was very much a feature of civilized living in antiquity. We know that the Romans sort of had fountains with various sculptural combinations as centerpieces around the city, which in a sense demonstrated their power over water. But was their technology really that powerful? Contemporary writings imply that the Colosseum could stage a sea battle almost at the drop of a hat. But that would require channeling over four and a half million liters of water into or out of the hypogeum in just a few hours. Hydraulic expert Martin Crapper has come to make some calculations. Professor Beste believes that they did it. The first channel, we have five channels in the Colosseum. The water came from the second channel and enter here. Of this. I see, this leads down into yes. the shaft. Yes, in the shaft. Underneath in Hyper yeah. This is the bottom end of the vertical shaft that we were looking at. Yes, oh, yes, yes, yes. The water came from the high up end. And so how, how deep would they actually fill it to? I think uh, what's lower, I think what's one meter high. Like any public building in Rome, the Colosseum had an extensive series of drains connected to the water supply. These five circular channels under the seating could help feed water into the hypogeum. But where did the water come from? The Colosseum sits in a valley flanked by three of Rome's seven hills. The Esquiline, the Palatine, and the Caelian. A small stream called the San Gregorio is supposed to have flowed right underneath the site. Could this have been the source of the water? 
The Colosseum Valley has changed a lot in 2,000 years. Ground level has risen by almost 10 meters. The San Gregorio stream is still there, but now it flows underground. Let's have a go with the flow meter and see what it tells us. Given us a sort of 0 0.03 meters a second, so that's pretty low, low flow speed. And it's not a very big channel either. It's about a foot wide and maybe six inches deep. So um, that's a pretty low flow. It would not have made a significant contribution to the hypogeum, for instance. So if the local water supply was insufficient, the Colosseum must have been linked to ancient Rome's aqueducts. This 100 kilometer long network of channels was the pride of the empire. But was it big enough to supply over a million liters an hour? the rate needed to flood the Colosseum overnight. Somehow, Dr. Crapper has to calculate the amount of water that flowed through a system which hasn't existed for 1,500 years. 1, Fortunately, one of the channels is still flowing, but it can only be reached by a little-known access point. Today, the Aqua Virgo supplies the Trevi Fountain. 2,000 years ago, it was just one of 11 aqueducts crisscrossing the ancient city. The speed is about 0.3 meters a second. That gives us a flow rate uh, of about 80 gallons a second, something of that order. Water level's quite well below the arch there. In ancient times, this would have carried more flow than this, so probably at least four times that. This ancient channel is the vital link Dr. Crapper needed to assess Rome's water system. By calculating the flow through this channel, which passes just 150 meters from the Colosseum, and its height above the arena floor, he can determine exactly how long it would take to flood the hypogeum. Taking into consideration the size of the actual inlet pipes you've got um, and the amount of water you could reasonably expect to get through those, I reckon it would perhaps have taken six or seven hours to fill the hypogeum of the Colosseum, certainly much less than a day, so it is a practical thing to do. So, our research has shown that the stagehands could have removed the arena floor, the drains could have been sealed, and the hypogeum could have been flooded to a depth of one or two meters in less than half a day. We know the Romans could have done it. Wow, this is amazing, Dan. But we still don't know whether they did. Watch it on the stairs, they're pretty steep here. Evidence that the Colosseum was designed to be flooded would be significant. This is a Roman cistern, one of the few left. The Romans were experts in materials science, and large water cisterns and baths were routinely lined with a coating of high-quality waterproof mortar. Here's the main inlet from the aqueduct. A technology so, which the yeah, Romans invented and perfected. And the water would spill into this That's room. correct, yeah. How quickly? Mm. Well, the mortar here say, has kept this building functioning and watertight for 1,800 years. If the designers of the Colosseum's underground hypogeum knew that it was going to be flooded, they would have coated it with waterproof mortar, similar to that in their cisterns. But did they? The Amphitheatrum Caesarium was one of the preeminent wonders of Roman antiquity. For nearly five centuries, the building survived as a functioning, crowd-pleasing game stadium. Until earthquakes, fires, and a shortage of cash finally closed the place down in AD 523. Today, we call it the Roman Colosseum. It's become a magnificent 2,000-year-old tourist magnet. And yet, behind the myths and legends, its walls and corridors still hold many secrets. From the underground waterways to the ghost-filled corridors of the Hypogeum, there is still a lot to learn about what really happened here. One of the most perplexing questions concerns the chemical composition of the walls in the basement. Well, here is a thin section of the Colosseum there. It's very nicely done. Professors Rudy Wenk and Paolo Montero, experts on concrete, are looking for signs of a key Roman waterproofing ingredient, a volcanic sand called pozzolan. Oh, before you go, maybe you should check. If they find what they're looking for, then perhaps they can prove that great sea battles were staged here. The Romans did not use this pozzolanic material in every construction. They were very careful in using it. It was expensive. So they would only use this pozzolanic hydraulic cement if they have a need for that. But for the mortar to keep out the water, the volcanic sand had to react to create a gluey paste, filling all the microscopic pores. For the sample from the cistern, the formula was perfect. Really, this is fantastic concrete. We see no pores. It would be very hard to duplicate even with modern concrete. This is 
amazing achievement. But the Colosseum sample was not so clear cut. So I think we should go to, uh, to the SM. electron microscope. Definitely. Under an electron microscope, the picture became clearer. I am zeroing in on that spot now. I need to do a chemical analysis on about a one micron area. Let's see what it is. Okay, we've got a big calcium peak, got a small silicon peak. And finally, X-ray analysis searching for the chemical fingerprint of the volcanic glue. Here's the cistern sample. The hump shows this is strongly waterproof. Now, the mortar from the hypogeum of the Colosseum. The hump is there, but it's much smaller. Kind of disappointing. I was expecting to have a big hump and say, aha, we don't have that. It's clear indication that they use some pozzolanic material. And if the intent was to achieve a waterproof system, uh, I would claim that did not do as a good job as they've done in other cases. So although the hypogeum walls were certainly waterproofed, it was not done in a way that would have offered years or even centuries of protection, as is the case with the other big Roman water systems. The question is, why not? The fact that the mortar that lined the basin of the Colosseum couldn't withstand repeated flooding is not at odds with the historical evidence. It may have been that in the early days of the Colosseum itself, the inaugural portion of it, that they used it just a few times. And that seems to be the answer. Now, Machiai, naval battles, almost certainly were staged in the Colosseum when it was first inaugurated in AD 80. And what a spectacle they must have been. Full-size trireme battle galleys crewed by hundreds of prisoners of war, locked in deadly combat in and out of the water. Unlike the more sportsmanlike fights of the gladiators, these battles were fierce, frantic, and often fatal. Some people, of course, would not have actually been killed. They might have drowned. They might have fallen overboard. And even with a relatively shallow degree of flooding, if people couldn't swim, they might well, weighed down by armor or perhaps with a knock on the head, they might well drown. So I think the, the, the casualties were probably quite considerable. But I'm afraid that is something the arena was associated with. What the Romans did in the name of entertainment, the enormous productions and expense, was truly remarkable. But if you compare that to what we do today, there's great similarities. We spend enormous amount of money entertaining people through the production of television and film and sports. And we have our arenas. Perhaps people don't die there purposely, but they're there to entertain, to provide the spectacle. The team seems to have proved that the Romans did find a way of transferring four and a half million liters of water in and out of the well of the Hypogeum whenever they wanted to. So Martialis, the poet, probably was telling the truth. Sea battles were conducted here in the Amphitheatrum Caesarium, the Roman Colosseum. But eventually, the huge expense of staging them became prohibitive, and the hypogeum was filled with the walls and corridors we can see today. Nearly 2,000 years later, we are left with a maze of subterranean corridors and soaring terraces that still echo to the roar of the crowds, the clash of mortal combat, and the silence of a sudden death.